Uh, so I want to start out by introducing our first speaker. That's Ross Walker from here at SDSC. Ross, um, originally I thought he was going to be presenting remotely from the UK. It turns out he's in the chair next to me at my desk, so that's a lot more convenient. <laughs> um, uh, Ross is going to talk to us about his work on the use of GPU accelerators to speed up molecular dynamics simulations. And I believe it's the, the first time he's talking about this particular topic. Um, the work can be featured um, perhaps in an upcoming paper. Um, and I want to thank Ross very much for joining us. And I will advance the slides. And I think you've got the, the mic right here. OK, thanks, Nancy. So uh, I hope everybody can hear me OK. Please uh, message if you can't, and I'll move closer to the phone. Uh, so I've worked for quite a long time on using GPUs to accelerate molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, and I've actually talked before when this was under TerraGrid uh, about that work. But what I want to talk to today is some new work we've actually been doing on what's termed accelerated molecular dynamic simulations, uh, which here we refer to as AMD. Uh, the problem being that we have a clash with GPU accelerated, accelerated molecular dynamics. Uh, but essentially, this is ways to use both GPUs to improve the speed at which the calculations run, but also use some tweaks for the underlying algorithms to actually improve the rate at which sampling occurs. So we basically get a double whammy in terms of what we can look at. And then basically how we apply this uh, to look at large scale motions in proteins. And I'm referring to this here as sampling for the 99% I'm not going to comment on that, but we'll see if anybody picks up on where the 99% comes from. Okay, we can go forward a slide. So just to give you some background of a project here, this is actually really a combination of multiple projects. And I wanted to acknowledge those involved early on, because this is not entirely my work. Uh, but this is a combination of work. Presentation mode is now enabled. OK. Uh, Anyway, so uh, technically, this is an ECSS project uh, with Professor Adrian Reutberg at the University of Florida. And most of the work I've done here has been essentially to do the implementation to support Adrian's work. But the actual underlying theory that we're implementing here came out of Professor Andrew McCammon's lab at UCSD. And in particular, a lot of this work in terms of the simulations and validation that's been done, has been done by Levi Pierce, who is a graduate student in a McCammon lab, uh, but also collaborates closely with myself at uh, SDSC. And then this is also funded under grants to my own lab, which is uh, an NSF SI2 SSC award and a UC Lab award, uh, which essentially pay for my postdoc, Romelia Salomon, uh, who has helped to do a lot of the coding and testing work here. So uh, I just want to get that out of the way, first of all, that there's a number of people involved in this project. But uh, I'm going to talk about it really from the ES ECSS side of it, which is really what got this work going in the first place. So just a brief outline of the talk. Uh, I'm going to talk very quickly about what enhanced sampling is and what the idea behind it is. Uh, there are many, many different areas of enhanced sampling, far too many to go through in, in the context of this talk. So I'm going to restrict it to what we call AMD, which is Accelerated Molecular Dynamics. Then I'm briefly going to talk about uh, molecular dynamics on GPUs and the work we've done to accelerate that. And then talk about the actual uh, guts of this work, which is combining both the enhanced sampling with the MD on GPUs. Uh, I'll go through some of the scaling of the new code, and then I'll show an application to uh, the bovine pancreatic trypsin inhibitor uh, enzyme, which is going to form a basis of a publication that we're going to hopefully submit by this Friday. Uh, so why do we need enhanced sampling? Uh, this basically comes down to timescales. And that is that there's on the order of about 16, ma 16 magnitudes of range uh, in terms of time scales for proteins. Right? At the very bottom end, we have on the order of femtoseconds, uh, where we have bond vibrations and so on. And that's the sort of scales where uh, you see that in an infrared uh, spectrometry and so on, the, like on the order of about 2,000 wave numbers. That's what you see for bond vibrations. 
And then we go up and you have a summarization uh, that occurs on the order of picoseconds. Uh, the dynamics of water, water re rearranges on the order of nanoseconds. And then the formation of helix and some of the fastest folding proteins fold on the order of microseconds. But most things take part on the order of milliseconds uh, to seconds. So the real range we're interested in, mostly for our biological systems, is actually in the top end of a microsecond to millisecond range. Uh, obviously, if anybody's familiar with molecular dynamics, uh, people typically talk these days in terms of simulations in the order of nanoseconds. So, and you can get to microseconds these days with modern machines and so on, but that's really pushing the envelope. Uh, so obviously, we have three orders of magnitude difference between what we want to look at and the sort of ranges we can simulate. So the motivation behind this is actually what we're really interested in is rare events. If you take you can take a protein as I as I show here on a very simplified energy plot. You have two minima here and if you run, you can set up these simulations and run them and the thing will happily sit around in the minima exploring. Uh, and that's of some use. But it's where well, if you want to calculate binding free energies and so on, you can do this. But what's really interesting is actually how it goes about transitioning between these minima. And that's the part that occurs on a very rare event, which is what needs the long time scale. Uh, and essentially, the probability of something crossing there is related to the height of the barrier, or exponentially related to the height of that barrier. So. Uh, essentially, with proteins, when you've got large-scale motions between them, they're going to have some very high barriers, uh, and you might only see one crossing on the order of milliseconds. So, uh, essentially, we need more and better ways of doing the sampling. Right? And you'll see there's many different approaches people have taken. Uh, on the simple side of just making the calculations faster, we've got work that's done with GPUs. Obviously, people look at parallel scaling. And uh, there's a machine called Anton, which I'll talk about in a bit, which is built by uh, a guy called David Shaw, who runs his own research group out of uh, Manhattan, who has spent on the order of $100 million developing custom hardware to do molecular dynamic simulations. And he's now got to the point where they can run millisecond simulations of uh, things such as BPTI, uh, but clearly you need access to one of these machines and it's way beyond any of our budgets. Uh, so we've been looking essentially at more advanced ways of doing this sampling. Uh, some examples of metadynamics, AMD as we talk about here, and replica exchange. So what is accelerated molecular dynamics? I'm not going to go into details here. If anybody's really interested, it's described uh, clearly in all of the papers I've listed below here on this slide. But essentially the idea is that you take a you take a well in the energy potential and you essentially shift it up by a known biasing potential, which is the delta V here. Uh, and at a very simple level, that can just be a number that you add. Right? So, so we typically tend to do this on the dihedrals. So you would take the dihedral energy uh, and whenever it's lower than a certain threshold, you would shift it up by a proportional amount. Uh, the nice thing about this is that you can actually unbias this at the end of your simulation. So you can run your simulation on this bias potential, which of course has lowered the barriers and so increases the frequency of crossing. Uh, and because you know the biasing potential that you added to this, when you're done, you can back this out and get back all the probabilities. The issue, of course, is that you lose the exact time scales. Right? No longer is a second of simulation a real second of simulation. However, you do you can get free energies out of this and so on, which is what most people are interested in. Uh, the next slide just shows uh, an example of this. So the black line here would be the true potential, for example, the potential energy as a function of some kind of uh, conformational coordinate. And the red dotted line would be the modified potential. And that's essentially adding uh, a flat boost number, which is just a fixed number that you add to these calculations, which is a function of what the surface looks like. Which actually, So what you're actually adding is the green line. And that's what gives you the red dotted line. 
Now, of course, the problem with this approach is you don't know what to set that boost to a priori. Uh, if you set it too high, you just completely wash out all of your dynamics. If you set it too low, you don't get enough boost. So what we've done in this work is developed a way to run uh, a large number of different simulations at once with different levels of boost. And then from that, you can choose the one that actually, actually gives you the best option. Uh, I'm hoping to continue this work actually to look at doing this on Amazon's EC2 cloud, which is going to be part of uh, hopefully renewed SI2 funding. Uh, the idea being that you would set up one of these calculations to run in the cloud, and you would just tell it, I want a 1,000 different boost levels to be run. And the system would automate all of that for you, uh, run it on uh, the EC2 GPU nodes, and then come back with essentially a summary of the results. Uh, so it doesn't. So you no longer need to set up a thousand simulations and run them, and so on. So that's the very brief overview of accelerated molecular dynamics. I now just want to talk about the idea of computation on the GPU. Uh, right now, there. There's a number of codes that run uh, the GPU accelerated. One that's missing off of here is the LAMPS code, which is maturing right now. But essentially, there's AMBA, uh, which is what I work on. There's a code called ASMD out of uh, Imperial College in London, uh, OpenMM out of VJ Pandy's group at Stanford, and NAMBI out of uh, Klaus Schulten's group at uh, UAUC. Uh, obviously, I'm going to focus on AMBA here, given this is what we're working on. But the, the graph on the right essentially sums up uh, the differences in performance. Now, there's a lot of information on here, but the key ones to look at is down at the bottom of that slide, we have uh, 48 by X5670. Uh, so that's four nodes, uh, and that gets you about 30 nanoseconds per day uh, for uh, this is a simulation of dihydrofolate reductase. Uh, no, large is good, because this is uh, throughput. Sorry, this oh, is throughput. throughput. Uh, yeah, so this is throughput in nanoseconds a day. So the longer the line, the better. Uh, so, so the key is the 64 uh, cores, uh, because this is quite a small system. Uh, so on the CPU, it tops out at about 30 to 35 nanoseconds per day, and then you don't get any more. Uh, looking up about... Uh, just over a third of the way up this plot, you'll see uh, the one times GTX 580 plot, which is 40 nanoseconds a day. So that's a single $500 graphics card that you can put in a desktop, and that will exceed uh, the, essentially the fastest of uh, CPU systems that you can put together with InfiniBand and so on right now for a single simulation. If you put two GTX 580s in a single node right now, we get about 55 nanoseconds per day. And then going up to the very top, and when we go to AM 2090s, we're up to 76 nanoseconds per day. Uh, when the Kepler cards come out, we're hoping this will double. So we'll be on the order of about 140 nanoseconds per day of simulation. Uh, obviously, that puts us in the realm of being able to do microsecond simulations quite easily, uh, but we can't get anywhere near the millisecond regime. Uh, as things stand right now, even even if we improve the scaling significantly, uh, but this is, is essentially this is revolutionising the way in which people do dynamics right now because you can where where you used to have to run on the large scale supercomputers, you can now run, run this on a single desktop and get a uh, speed that would exceed what you would normally get on uh, on the Xceed machines. Uh, or you can run these sorts of things on Keeneland, for example, or any of the other GPU machines, especially if you wanted to run multiple levels of boost or multiple different simulations and so on. Uh, we go to the next slide. So one of the first things we did over the last couple of years is actually implement molecular uh, essentially vanilla molecular dynamics itself on the GPUs. Uh, what we've done in this work is to implement the accelerated molecular dynamics, so added the accelerated MD potential to the GPU code. Uh, we did this in a number of stages. First, uh, this was implemented into Sander, which is essentially the sandbox, as we can call it, I guess, of the uh, Amber Molecular Dynamics engine. That's really designed for anyone to add new features on, but it doesn't scale very well. Uh, and the performance is terrible, as you can see from the 
triangles of this plot of these plots on the right. Uh, and that code really is just designed for any graduate student to add any new method, etc. Uh, then we have a code called PMEMD, which is essentially a spatially decomposed uh, code designed to scale much, much better than the uh, traditional Sander code. So the first thing we did was to port the AMD method to the CPU version of the PMEMD code, and that gives us the red squares on the right there. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, Wang et al. Uh, implemented the method in NAMD, and that gives you the uh, blue line, uh, which is a very similar performance essentially to PMEMD. Uh, NAMD tends to scale a little better on higher process accounts. Uh, but then, uh, beyond that, we took uh, myself and Romina Salomon, my postdoc, took the method and put it onto the GPUs, uh, and that gives you the yellow square. Uh, on the plot on the right, which is essentially a single GTX uh, 580, can give us on the order of 43 nanoseconds per day. Uh, and actually comparing this, we see here the numbers down the bottom show 43.2 nanoseconds per day for regular molecular dynamics, and we get 41.3 for the accelerated MD. So the performance hit you get from adding in the extra functions involved in the AMD is actually quite minimal. Uh, so we're at on the order of, if we take BPTI here down the bottom, uh, we get we can get on the order of 35 to 40 nanoseconds per day of sampling using this accelerated method on, on a single desktop machine. Go to the next slide. Uh, so, oh, okay, it doesn't come up with the animation. Fail. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah sorry. That's not going to yeah. work. Uh, okay. The, the I can slides post are it. posted on the symposium website, so there's animations because the conferencing software uh, okay. doesn't let us use. All right. So, so, so the, what you can see on top here on the right is a cartoon diagram of, of BPTI, uh, and this is a simulation that was published by uh, David Shaw and uh, D. Shaw Research in Science in 2010, and what they did is took their $100 million Anton system and used it to run this simulation. The reason they chose BPTI is it's actually the first molecular dynamic simulation of a protein that was run back in 1977 uh, by, Andy, by Professor Andy McCammon, who ran this for 10 picoseconds. Uh, they ran the whole simulation for a millisecond in their system. They get about 10 microseconds a day uh, out of that system. But that's a custom built system purely for doing molecular dynamics. And that's all it does is pure molecular dynamics. Uh, so they ran a they ran a millisecond simulation of this and published essentially their analysis, which showed that this protein is very dynamic. It actually goes through a number of different structures, which is shown by these numbers on the left here: uh, zero, one, two, three, four. These were basically five specific structures that they saw this thing transition through during the simulation. And the plot you can't see uh, that's under the cartoon diagram that basically just shows. Uh, color an RMSD of this thing to the native to the to the crystal structure as a function of time, and you can see that it goes back and forth between these five structures. Uh, so this was key because no one had actually seen this result in molecular dynamic simulations before. People always base uh, base things on just the crystal st structure, but actually this was the first evidence we've seen. Uh, and it correlates with some of the NMR work that people are doing these days in experimentally. But it showed that these proteins can actually go through a number of different uh, structures. And obviously, their activity is, a, is an average over these structures, actually. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. So we decided to try and reproduce this work uh, using our AMD approach, the idea being we couldn't run, uh, we couldn't run a millisecond simulation even if we tried. Uh, but we can run, we ran here 200 nanoseconds, we've now run this out to a microsecond. So we can run a microsecond of simulation using our uh, modified potential. Uh, so we essentially contacted Shaw and got all of the information about their simulation from the science paper, uh, uh, including uh, their three terabytes of tra trajectory that they sent us on a hard disk. Uh, so we could actually do the analysis ourselves and compare to our work. So we basically set about setting the system up 
absolutely identically to how Shaw did. Uh, the same number of atoms, same bulk size. We used the exact same fossil that they used, the same water model. And then we ran, the results I've got here are for 200 nanoseconds, but as I say, we ran this out to a microsecond now. Uh, and then we had the actual acceleration levels, that's the boost level we used, was based on earlier work we'd actually done on this enzyme. Uh, but if you were doing this from scratch, the way you do this is to run a, a series of simulations of different boosts uh, and compare the differences. And we've got tools that will actually look at the results you get and pick the optimal boost parameter. Uh, but if we go through to the next slide, <coughs> so this summarizes uh, some of the results. Now, one of the first things that we saw is actually within our 200 nanoseconds of simulation, we actually see all five of the structures that uh, Shaw saw in their one millisecond simulation. Uh, and we get uh, within, I think now we've got everything within one angstrom RMSD to the structures they saw. At this, this point in the 200, 200 nanoseconds, there's a couple that are around, the, uh, I think the highest is 1.9 angstroms. Uh, but we actually see that come lower now. So we get, we essentially see every one of these structures. Now, if you were to just run classical MD on this, you pretty much don't get out of that zero structure. That's the only thing you see. You won't see any of the others here. And I've got some slides later that illustrate this. So if we go to the next slide. So if we take some the results we got and do some analysis on this, uh, this is just doing an RMSD uh, pairwise matrix analysis between frames. But essentially, uh, the key points here are the triangles and squares show the five structures that were seen in the original shore simulation. The yellow dots show what you see if you just run a standard molecular dynamic simulation, the key being that you don't cross over to the right of that plot. Uh, and then the gray dots are what we see essentially in our, uh, in our actual accelerated MD simulation. And if we go to the next slide, uh, and you can take this and you can do, and this covers up again, unfortunately, but uh, the top two show it pretty well, though, actually. So if you do a principal component analysis on this, uh, what you see is the blue, I guess they're gray on this side. The, the, on the left-hand side, the blue dots uh, show what you see from a standard MD simulation. As you see, in 200 nanoseconds, you see very little. Uh, the red show what we see in the accelerated MD simulation, so we get much more effective sampling of face space, and we do cover all of the structures that they saw in the science paper. And then on the right, we show essentially a probability map, and as you see, we do get the basin correct, and you still stay in the main basin on the left, but we do sample the other sections. Uh, yeah, so that doesn't show up. Anyway. So then, uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll remember this the next time. So if we do uh, principal component analysis, we're unfortunately missing the main part of this uh, thing. Well, you can barely see it on the right. The key being, yeah, uh, essentially if we look at the correlation of two of the uh, uh, dihedral angles in uh, cysteine residues, and this was analysis that you did in the science paper, uh, what you see in, if you just do a basic molecular dynamic simulation, is you only see one tiny region of that plot. Uh, if you do the accelerated MD simulation, we see a series of plots which cover, again, all of those five structures that they see. Uh, if we skip through. That's, uh, it doesn't come up with this. <laughs> yeah, this is too bad. Ross has yeah. all these nice animations that are not showing up in the web conference at all. Um, uh, the original slides are up on the ECSS yeah. symposium page, but still, yeah, sorry. Okay. I've got a note to look into this and switch conferencing yeah, right. software. Well, well, I, just, I just went through that. If you, yeah. So uh, put everything on separate slides. Is, is, oh, yeah. yeah. But uh, the main thing being here, essentially, if we take our 200 nanosecond simulation and we cluster it, which is you look at... Uh, key structures that are seen throughout the simulation, you do recover the exact same clusters that are seen in the essentially vanilla millisecond long MD simulation that uh, uh, was described in Shaw's science paper. Uh, and that includes, if we look at some of the identification of the stable states, so this is uh, obviously you see a lot of structures where these things transition, but every now and then, 
uh, you find states that the thing essentially gets stuck in for a while and it comes back and revisits these states. And these are the key minima because this is, this is what becomes the biologically active part. And if you were looking at a drug for one of these enzymes, uh, typically people would look at the crystal structure or something similar to the crystal structure, but really what you actually want is a drug that's going to bind to multiple versions of these structures, for example, or could bind to one of these structures. If you were calculating a binding free energy and you only looked at the structure on the far left, you'd miss all the potential for binding in, in different sites in, in, and so on. Uh, so it's important to be able to see all of the different structures that these things uh, go through. And the key being here, uh, using the AMD simulations, uh, we do actually see all of those structures on this test system. Uh, obviously, we've got a long way to go with actually testing this server. Uh, but the main point is if we go to the next slide, I just want to compare the difference between the two. Uh, and maybe this is where you might notice the 99% comes from. Uh, on the left, we have Anton. Uh, I say this costs several million. Hard to estimate what they really spent on this. I estimate it's about $100 million uh, to develop this system. Uh, it consumes 116.5 kilowatts per rack. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> uh, uh, and this is all custom-made silicon, right? There's no, this is a, there's, there's this is designed from scratch and programmed in machine code, essentially. Uh, there's about 100 people involved in uh, DE Shore research. Uh, and the main thing being the code is essentially hardwired into the silicon. Uh, what that means is it's very difficult to uh, make changes because you've got to re, re blow the whole silicon. It's, uh, you can do limited changes. Uh, they've got some uh, 10 silica chips in there that are reprogrammable, but it's very limited on what you can do. Uh, so it can do vanilla MD very, very fast, as I say, on the order of milliseconds. On the right, uh, we have the MD SIM cluster program that I put together with NVIDIA, and this is basically small clusters you can buy from various uh, different manufacturers. The example I give here is from Exact. Uh, and this comes pre-installed with Amber, uh, ready to run out of the box, queuing system, and so on. And uh, a four-node system for this, which will be eight M2090 Tesla GPUs, uh, runs about $30,000. Uh, and obviously, with eight GPUs in there, you can run eight of these AMD simulations at the same time. Uh, that rack is displayed there. This is essentially what we use to do these simulations in this work. Uh, that consumes about 4.5 kilowatts of power, uh, and there's about eight people involved. And the key being we actually have flexible code, so we can reprogram things on the fly here. Uh, oh, I'm ready to wrap up soon, yep. Ross. Slide. Oh, there okay. we go. So, that's <laughs> so some conclusions. Uh, basically, right now, under the ECSS project, we've successfully ported the AMD method to the GPU. Uh, and a single to get the same speed as we get on a single $500 GPU, if you want to use a, one of the gaming cards, you need on the order of 144, probably to 100, 160 uh, CPUs, CPU cores. Uh, and obviously then you need InfiniBand interconnects and everything else. Uh, but the nice thing is using this approach, we can actually sample uh, the same phase space that, that, that was explored using by using a millisecond of regular molecular dynamics. Uh, and We've also got some more work where I haven't discussed here where we've looked at long-lived waters and we actually get the water structure correct around the system as well and we get all of the Chi-1 states uh, sampled. And we were able to run this in about three days as opposed to 100 days to get the millisecond simulation. Uh, so my point being that you just need to be smart about the way in which you do the sampling, uh, potentially rather than spending hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, I wouldn't have to hundreds of dollars. <laughs> and then just finally some acknowledgements. I said I put the acknowledgements at the beginning, so I just want to acknowledge again, in particular, Amelia and Levi, who are the backbone behind uh, a lot of the actual science in this work. Obviously, Adrian at, U at University of Florida and Andrew McCammon at UCSD, and then National Science Foundation for funding this, both through the SI2 program and through Exceed. Uh, and NVIDIA for uh, their support and uh, help with the optimization of the code and donating hardware and so on.
And then uh, thanks to all of you for listening. Thank you very much, Ross. I'll, uh, I've got a quick question. I'll, looks like there's one from the audience here. And then we'll, we'll probably take just a couple of questions and then uh, move on to allow enough time for our second speaker. So the work for Roy Berg, uh, was he was involved in looking at you know, more time scales or reporting to GPUs specifically? So, so, so Adrian's initial, the initial work with Adrian was, was the pilot work we did on the initial GPU pool. And his orig that was part of his original, uh, it was actually, I guess it was Aster or IUS. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then. So he had an allocation so on like original, Keelan yeah. or Forge so or something. Was, this was like two years ago, and then he extended it for another year, uh, which is where we've now looked at this. And what I haven't covered here as well, because I just thought it was too much to put in, is we've looked at adding replica exchange simulations as well as part of this. That Adrian is now using in his group to do simulations on a lot of different systems than just the BPCI that I put here. And all of this is getting released as part of Amber 12 in about two. Years. And then they'll get installed on Keeneland and so on. Okay, so, great. And Forge. And yep. yep. Uh, we've got a question from Amit Tarazia who asks whether Anton simulates one millisecond in one day. No. Uh, so for BPTI, I'm not sure what the exact numbers are for BPTI. Uh, for the DHFR, which is the, the numbers I showed where we get about 70 nanoseconds a day, uh, they get about 10 microseconds per day. So a millisecond simulation is about 100 days of simulation on one rack of the Anton system. And I think they've built about 12 racks now. So. Presentation uh, mode is now disabled. Nancy? Yeah, we've got a question from Ralph Roski. Yeah, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Okay, a couple of questions. Uh, you said at one point that in order to figure out what the what the delta v has to be, you have to do like a thousand runs of different. Not, uh, not necessarily. I mean, uh, the, the, in some ways, that's the art side of this work, which is uh, once you get experience running these calculations, you know for certain systems what what that boost level needs to be. Uh, what we've tended to do, the, the reason we I say a thousand runs is because we've done, uh, we've actually done some extensive sampling of what the boost that what effect the boost value has, and so we can get a very detailed understanding of that. I would say you could probably narrow down the boost level you'd need if you were experienced doing these simulations with on the order of ten to twenty runs or so. Okay. Uh, I mean, but it, but it. There is there is some art to that right now, unfortunately. Okay, and um, the results that you're quoting are for one of them that you think is going to be best, right? Uh, yes, that's for one boost level. Right. Uh, okay. a second. Now that's not that's not entirely based on knowing the answer before we started. Though. No, no, uh, I understand. Um, I'm guessing. The second question is: You say you get all the five structures that Shaw saw. Do you also get other structures? No, we don't. Uh, huh. Which is interesting, actually. So we don't. Uh, there's a cu there's a couple of runs where if the boost is too high, the thing just unfolds completely, and that's pretty obvious. Uh, but when we do the cluster analysis, if we use the same parameters they used for the clustering, because obviously you can choose a priori how many clusters you, you actually want. But if we use the same same underlying parameters, we get the same five structures out that they got. So I'm, I'm confident, and you couldn't see it in some of the free energy plots, but I'm confident uh, that, that we see the same dynamics they do, and we're not just washing it out completely. So. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Ross. I think with that, we'll move on to our second speaker. Um, one of the nice things about ECSS is that there's such a, a wide variety of activities that we're all involved in. We're going to switch gears quite a bit here. Marlon Pierce, from Indiana University is going to talk to us about the Open Gateway Computing Environments work with the Apache Software Foundation. So this is really interesting work that um, open source software and community contributions and kind of the whole uh, um, uh, governance model and contribution model that it takes to really accept uh, you know, a wide range of contributions from the community. Uh, so with that, uh, Marlon, I think that I've made you a presenter, and you should be able to advance your own slides. Okay, thanks, Nancy. I'll, I'll give it a try. Is, 
Uh, is Presentation okay? mode is now enabled. Can you hear me okay? Yep, go ahead. All right, so I'm on speakerphone, so please let me know if, if uh, the sound's not good. And also, uh, that was an excellent talk that we just heard. Um, so anyway, I have this quite uh, lengthy title uh, about developing software tools within the Apache Software Foundation. So the subtitle here, which is I'm, I'm going to try and expand on, is the Going Beyond Open Source. And um, hopefully I can advance. What do I need to do to advance? You should 